Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ragesh Tongri. I'm the president of the Northern District Historical Society. And on behalf of the board of the society, I would like to welcome you all and thank you all for joining us this afternoon for what I know will be a fantastic program. My only role here beyond that is to introduce you to our moderator for this afternoon's program, Judge Ed Chen of this district, who had himself the privilege to clerk for Judge Renfrew uh, shortly before Judge Renfrew left the bench here and, and moved to Washington. And without further ado, Judge Chen. Thank you. I, uh, uh, I had the privilege of clerking for Judge Renfrew and the dubious distinction of being his last clerk uh, before he left the bench. Now, I know that suggests uh, a causal relationship, but let me assure you that my incompetence was not the only reason that he left uh, the bench. Uh, as you know, uh, Judge Renfrew was called uh, to answer a higher calling uh, by President Jimmy Carter uh, in 1980. Um, let me first uh, uh, welcome all of you and thank you on behalf of this court and on behalf of the Historical Society of this district and to briefly introduce and acknowledge the Renfrew family who is here. If you could hold your applause uh, till we get the whole group uh, introduced, maybe you can all stand. Uh, Barbara Renfrew, of course, uh, who's been by, who had been by uh, Judge Renfrew's side for so many years. Um, Judge Renfrew had uh, 10 has 10 grandchildren, two great-grandchildren, and 11 step-grandchildren. And so uh, I think half the audience here is probably a member of the family. But with us are Todd and Marty Renfrew, uh, David and Mandy Ingram, uh, Stanton Orser, Henson and Susan Orser, uh, Gilbert and Jennifer Orser, and Honey and Chase Orser. And these represent both uh, children and grandchildren. And, uh, stepchildren and step grandchildren. Can you all rise and so people can acknowledge you all? Thank you. Uh, the program managers uh, of today's program has assembled a, a, a great uh, collection of people who have either served under Judge Renfrew. Uh, served with him or in front of him. And we're going to hear from everybody who fits into one of those categories. Um, and so the, the breadth and depth of, uh, of Judge Renfrew's character, which was remarkable, and his career on the bench, though short as it was, was remarkable. I mean, just the thought that, you know, he served on this court from 1971, December 1971, through February of 1980, really uh, just about eight years. And that says something. For somebody to gain such a sterling reputation, a national reputation, and to be called away uh, by the president to serve a higher office, although some would argue that's not a higher office than being a judge in this court, uh, nonetheless, uh, that says something. I mean, all in a span of eight years, I realize I've been here almost eight years, and people still don't think I'm a judge, uh, including those who appear before me. And there are people who have been on this bench several times as long, three times as long as Judge Renfrew, and have yet to distinguish themselves. <laughs> people like Judge Breyer, for instance. <clears throat> so what a contrast. And, and just to, to, to you're going to hear about why he was so accomplished, but just being in chambers and, and serving with him for the short period that I did, and you'll hear from fellow law clerk as well, it's just incredible. Um, things that people don't know about him was that he was a speed reader and that he did not ask his clerks to prepare bench memos in advance of law in motion. I would go into his chambers and he'd literally have a stack of files about two feet tall and he would go through all of the briefs himself. And he wouldn't even approach the clerks until after argument and then he would assign each of us the duty of drafting the order. I mean. I can't even imagine, I can't do anything without uh, some kind of bench memo in front of me telling me what I should do. Uh, but he was able to do that. And he also had this tremendous power, a little known perhaps, of a settlement judge. I remember one time uh, he uh, took a referral from, I think it was uh, Judge Oreck down the hall to help settle a case and the attorneys came in and they were 
they're like far apart, like 500,000 versus a million dollars. And he just looked at them and said, well, why don't you just split the difference? And the two attorneys looked at each other and said, okay, we'll split the difference. It was like a four minute settlement conference. And you know, those of us who've been magistrate judges would know what it's like to spend six hours, eight hours, and you get, can't get people to move. But he had the ability to make people move within about four minutes. Um, and so the one thing I will say before I turn this over to our first speaker is that um, I learned a lot of lessons from Judge Renfrew, but the most important one was the one that he considered the most important. That is, we should always keep in mind Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 1, the very first rule that requires us to construe the rules and administer them and enforce them in a manner to secure the just, speedy, and inexpensive determination of every action and proceeding. And that's a lesson that's an overarching lesson that I think uh, is a philosophy of this court with our active case management. It's now been embodied in the amendment to the rules some 30 years later in terms of proportionality and everything else. But Judge Renfrew saw through that and cut through that very quickly and taught me that very simple but important lesson. Uh, the first speaker uh, we have this afternoon is Tony Remby, a retired partner at Pillsbury Madison. And, no, it's not Madison, I'm sorry. Pillsbury Winthrop, I'm, I'm old school. Uh, Shaw and Pittman, where she serves as a member of the firm's uh, governing executive committee and managing partner of its tax practice. She's president of the Van Loben Cells Remby Rock Foundation uh, and is a co founder and an advisory board member of the Rock Center of the corporate governance of corporate governance at Stanford. Uh, she's also past president of the Commonwealth Club of California. Tony. I can even lower this. Okay. Um, I've known Charlie Renfrew for a long time, since 1964, when I uh, joined Pillsbury. And everybody called him Charles. I mean, Charlie. Uh, but Char I'll start out with Charles, because that's who he was to me when I first met him, as a first female associate at Pillsbury. And Charlie, at that time, happened to be uh, the head of the Associate Review Committee which had the responsibility of seeing that all the young associates were well taken care of once they joined the firm and had a positive experience during their first year there. Uh, I was told shortly after I joined the firm, uh, which was then called Pillsbury Madison Sutro, so I understand, um, uh, the, on Mondays we had a institution, a firm institution called school. And school meant that you, as a new associate, had to stand before a packed room in Pillsbury's library on the 20th floor of 225 Bush and report to the entire firm on a leading case, which was a terrifying experience for a young associate. And to me, uh, I didn't know anyone in the firm. It was kind of a sea of suits. And I thought, I really don't want to be the first one called to speak in school. So I went to see Charlie. And I said, Charlie, is there any way I can defer my opening at school until I get to know a few names of my colleagues? And I was told, no, there's, well, he said, just a minute. You know, the road man doesn't have to report in school. And I said, who's the road man? He said, the road man is a person that files the briefs, sees that they're properly filed in the courts, delivers papers to the printers, is on call at hours of the day and night, and making sure that important papers get delivered to the right person and done properly. And I said, I'll be road man. <laughs> so I started out in high heels carrying these heavy briefcases around, but I got to know people in the firm fairly fast but beyond that, Charlie soon approached me and he said, Tony, would you like another term as road man? And I said, I'm ready for school now, Charlie. <laughs> so, and Charlie had this wonderful sense of humor because for years after that, every once in a while, Charlie in the hall would stop me and say, gee, I heard they're looking for a new road man in the Associate <laughs> Review Committee. But uh, 
Charlie, needless to say, was very, very successful at Pillsbury. Uh, not only did he have a, was he a superior litigator with a rigorous practice, but he had chaired committees, he was on um, firm management, uh, he was active in the Bar Association, and I, I was only sorry I didn't have a chance to work with him more because I was a tax attorney and he was a litigator, and every once in a while when he's working on Chevron matters, I had a chance to talk to him about a tax matter. But you'll hear from my partner Harvey Hinman over here a little later about Charlie later in his career and about his, some of his experiences at Chevron. So thank you very much. Uh, Sherilyn Eiffel, president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, was scheduled to be here uh, to uh, give a talk about Judge Renfrew and his involvement with the Legal Defense Fund. Uh, unfortunately, she's been called away uh, on urgent matters, uh, but she sent a letter. And uh, we were privileged and very lucky to have with us somebody to read that letter, somebody who's also on the board. Uh, of LDF, uh, an old friend of this court, many of you know, Tony West. Um, Tony is now general counsel of Uber. Uh, he was the assistant, an assistant U.S. attorney in this district and was at Morrison for a number of years. And during the Obama administration, he served as assistant attorney general uh, and associate attorney general of uh, the department. Uh, Tony has traveled many roads and now he gets to ride for free. Uh, in his current job. So, uh, Tony, if you would uh, do the pleasure, give us the pleasure. Thank you, Judge Shen. Um, uh, and thank you. Uh, I'm so honored to be here, uh, both as a close friend of uh, Sherilyn Eiffel and uh, an admirer of uh, Judge Renfrew and, uh, of course, someone who deeply respects and admires his court and this bench. Uh, this is a letter that uh, Sherilyn wrote and wanted to, to present today, and uh, I've, I've edited it uh, just for time, but I know it'll be made available uh, to, to everyone uh, in its in entirety uh, after the uh, program. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I deeply regret that I cannot be with you to deliver these remarks in person as I'd hoped. We suffered a loss within our staff family this week that hit us all very hard and I had to travel to New Jersey this weekend to attend the services and support our staff member during an unimaginable tragedy. I'd hope to be with you in person because I take very seriously the treasure that is the broad and extraordinary LDF family. This family includes LDF alumni, lawyers and staff who, who share the unique experience of working and an organization that is truly like no other. But our family also includes those who've served on the board of LDF, an illustrious group of leaders in the legal profession, in civil rights, in government, and in business. For 78 years, LDF's board of directors reads like a who's who's list of some of the most important and impressive intellectuals, lawyers, business leaders, activists, and philanthropists in our country. More than just being accomplished and successful leaders, LDF board members must have a passionate commitment to equality and to justice. And Judge Charles Renfrew epitomized this spirit throughout his life and his illustrious career. Whether as a law firm partner, as a judge, or as Deputy Attorney General of the United States, Judge Renfrew found ways to let his commitment to justice, his commitment and his compassion, his equality and human dignity shine through. It is, after all, not every judge who took a heartfelt and keen interest in what happened to those litigants who appeared before him even after they left the courtroom. Judge Renfrew visited prisons to learn about the conditions in which those he sentenced would be held. He saw the people standing before him in the well of the court as human beings worthy of concern, dignity, and respect. I wish that every judge 
approached their work and saw their awesome power to shape the direction of the lives of the people who come before them in the same way that Judge Renfrew did. Too many do not. But Judge Renfrew allowed his deep humanity, his deep commitment to justice, guide how he exercised his power, the power, awesome power that he held as a federal court judge. Always on the lookout for board members who, under, who understood LDF's work, Jack Greenberg invited Judge Renfrew to join the board a few years after he left the department, and the judge was elected to the LDF's board of directors in 1982. He remained an active board member for more than three decades. Elaine Jones, LDF's fourth director counsel, described Judge Renfrew's contributions to LDF in remarks just last year. She said that Judge Renfrew believed in us, believed in our work. He understood the issues, delighted in our victories, and encouraged us in our defeats. Longtime donors and supporters like Judge Renfrew make LDF possible. We shall always, always be grateful to him. Judge Renfrew's signature contribution to LDF as a board member is an enduring one. Since 1972, LDF's Earl Warren Scholarship has provided financial support in the form of scholarships to law students in need. The scholarship was designed to prime the pump and support the development of African American lawyers in our country. Our hope is that those lawyers would feel connected to LDF's work and would become cooperating attorneys, pro bono counsel, and, and supporters of LDF once they joined the legal profession. And Judge Renfrew recognized the importance of sustaining this program and involving a broader network of lawyers in LDF's efforts to promote diversity in our profession. It was Judge Renfrew's brilliant idea that we work with the American Bar Association to create a committee of the bar which the judge chaired. And in the first three years, Judge Renfrew raised nearly $200,000 for the Earl Warren program through that committee of the bar. Today, everywhere I speak in the country, invariably one or two people, lawyers in their 40s and 50s, will come up to me at the end of my speech and announce proudly that they are former LDF Earl Warren scholars. They are the fruit of Judge Renfrew's efforts. And today, the Earl Warren Legal Scholars continue. It's an impressive and deeply moving uh, thing to witness firsthand the reach of this program in supporting successive generations of African American lawyers. As of this year, we now have provided scholarships to over 2,600 law students since the program's inception. These young law students and those we select as scholars every year are the future of our profession, the coterie of civil rights lawyers who are and will be so desperately needed as this country confronts this challenging and dangerous moment. Judge Renfrew's work has seeded into the future these young people. I met Judge Renfrew in 2013 at a reception given for me at the home of Pamela Joyner here in California. And the following year, I gave the commencement address at my alma mater, New York University Law School. A week later, I received a letter from Judge Renfrew commending me on my address. He was particularly pleased with the way I encouraged the law graduates to see their role in our profession and throughout the world. He remarked that it is vital that the students, he said, understand their obligations. He closed the letter by saying, whether the glass is half full or half empty is not important. What is essential is that the glass must be filled. Well, it is my honor to lead a staff of lawyers who fight every day to fill that glass. And it is my honor to share some thoughts with you about the life and contribution of a wonderful LDF board member who provided support, counsel, and encouragement to five LDF director councils and who as a board member influenced the careers and development 
of thousands of African-American lawyers, and who finally, through the example of his career, showed us our obligations to work for justice and to do justice, to demonstrate as lawyers humanity, compassion, and integrity, to bring a sense of optimism and relentless commitment to the improvement of our profession and our democracy. On behalf of the board and staff of the Legal Defense Fund, we salute the life of Judge Renfrew and offer our deepest condolences to the family. Sincerely, Sherilyn Eiffel, President and Director Counsel, NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Next, we're going to hear from Harvey uh, Hinman, who was uh, Vice President and General Counsel of Chevron between 1993 and 2002, and before that at Pillsbury, uh, Madison and Sutra, as it was then called. Uh, he serves as Vice Chairman of the Advisory Board of the Institute for International and Comparative Law, a Center for American and International Law, and is a member of the Board of Directors of the Legal Aid Society of San Francisco. Harvey? Good afternoon. If uh, Charlie was with us now, he'd be having this memorized, and uh, I wish I could, but he was great. He had that wonderful memory of his, and a speed reader, and somebody we could tell one of the best jokes, and you never knew whether it was a joke or was truthful, so <laughs> any event. Charlie served the country with distinction and many capabilities. He first, first as a, in the U.S. Navy, which I didn't realize, in 1946 to 1948. Second to the U.S. Army from 1952 to 1953 during the Korean War. Third as a federal district judge and fourth as attorney general, uh, as deputy attorney general for the United States. When Charlie first went on the bench, there was a shortage of judges and backlog of cases. So over time he started court at 8 a.m. in the morning, which uh, led to one counsel, probably in half joking, I would guess, saying to say that his, he said that his clients were being deprived of their Sixth Amendment right to, to, to counsel for having to appear so early in the morning. I wish I'd been there when Charlie heard that from somebody because he sacrificed a lot to get on top of those cases. Charlie was a superb lawyer, an outstanding judge, and a wonderful friend. Uh, I joined Pillsbury as a new associate in 1965, and that was the same year that Charlie became a partner. And shortly thereafter, we were both assigned to work with a senior litigator, Dick McClory, who was a very tough ex-Marine, and defending a case uh, attacking a joint operating agreement by the Justice Department under the antitrust laws. Uh, we, we spent the next six months uh, in Tucson. We both lived in apartments. We worked all day and night, it seemed. Uh, and uh, I wasn't going to put this in, but I... I did. Charlie always liked to think as he, he was a great cook, and he did a lot of the cooking. And his favorite dish was uh, steak smothered in lamb chops, and and that was about it. I'll tell you. <laughs> Any event, uh, when I think back on our long friendship, I remember fondly the interesting and fun dinner parties we had at the Renfrews on Clay Street. And uh, the only thing you had to worry about when you were there for dinner, and uh, I know. Justice George was there one night for dinner, was, was Charlie getting up from the table and walking the dog while you were in the middle of your dessert. A not, not too subtle reminder that it might be time for you to go home. <laughs> Any event. Upon completion of his term as Deputy Attorney General, Charlie returned to PMS, and in 1983, he became Chevron's Chief Legal Officer and Director. In such capacity, Charlie had the responsibility for overseeing Chevron's entire law function worldwide and serving on the board. One of Charlie's greatest achievements at Chevron was his personal involvement in shepherding through the FTC, Chevron's $13.2 billion merger with Gulf Oil Company. In that time, that was a challenge, a real challenge. And, uh, it turned out that he was successful in doing that, a lot on his own personal persuasion. But also, that was the largest merger in U.S. history at the time, and it was a great benefit to Chevron. Uh, Charlie, on Charlie's watch, the company also fought off Pennzoil, 
in an epic legal battle with Hugh Litke, Pennzoil CEO. Litke called that the start of that case, the start of World War III. We really hit him with a lot, and Charlie was right there, and uh, it was uncertain what was going to happen, but uh, the outcome was a very satisfying one for Chevron. Uh, I followed Charlie at Chevron in 1993 when he retired uh, from, from Chevron, when he retired and I became Vice President and General Counsel of Chevron. Charlie and Barbara could not have been nicer to us and made a huge difference in our transition to Chevron for Peggy and me. They organized and accompanied us on a tour of many of Chevron's overseas operations. Uh, and it was a unique tour. We had a wonderful time, a little bit of hard work here and there, but uh, uh, seeing Barbara here reminds me of this, uh, this. We had to give speeches everywhere we went, meet a lot of people, government leaders and everything else. Charlie didn't let it bother him, but he said at one point, I, I'm skip along. You can imagine Charlie Renfrew being skip along anything. We, it just broke us up. But he, he fancied himself as taking everything very carefully and easily. But we know a lot went into his work, a lot of went into his judgment. Uh, actually, during the trip, we, we had some adventures and moments. moments. Uh, we, our first, one of our first trop was, stops was into Papua New Guinea, into the highlands there, where uh, Michael Rockefeller had been lost and never found. And we were on a helicopter, and we overheard our pilots uh, saying that uh, when a thick bag of bank of fog came in, they weren't too certain where they were. And you can imagine the apprehension. You wouldn't want to put down in that area of Papua New Guinea. But, but in any event, and then in the North Sea off Aberdeen, Scotland, uh, we were the first to land on a offshore, new offshore platform before they'd put the guide rails in. And it was a very windy day, and I still remember Barbara you and Charlie getting off in your suits, heavy weather suits, and being almost blown off the edge of the platform, because grabbed by a couple workers, which is, it would have spoiled the trip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having followed Chevron, Charlie's footsteps at Chevron, I know how highly regarded he was by all those he worked with at Chevron, and also by other general counsel who we interfaced with through the Association of General Counsel, many of whom uh, when he, Charlie retired, referred major arbitrations and mediations his way. And he has a tremendous, all the nine, ten years I served with that organization, they all totally respected Charlie. Charlie was a wonderful guy and a pleasure to work with, and he possessed so many natural talents, both uh, natural talents which contributed to success and productivity both on and off the bench. And I'll just enumerate a few of those, his sharp intellect, his creativity, compassion, sound judgment, wonderful sense of humor, thoughtfulness, perseverance, and not to mention his speed reading and photographic memory, which I think was a challenge for a lot of lawyers that appeared before him on the bench when he, he probably seemed like he knew their briefs a lot better than they did. Charlie was also always able to find time to be with his wonderful family and to, pers and to pursue Barbara's and his love for fly fishing. He had a fall in a stream in Chile uh, some time back, and he said he was unique in turning fly fishing into a contact sport, and I think he, he probably did. In any event, he always gave Barbara credit for the catching the big fish. He always asked him how to go in Chile or Argentina, and it was always, Barbara got the big one, and I think it was probably true. Charlie was a very special person. He lived life to, to the fullest. He was always it's always hard to lose a close friend or loved one, but in Charlie's case, he was indeed fortunate. He was spared a long and agonizing end. Uh, it was a great privilege to work with Charlie, and he will be greatly missed. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, Judge Renfrew's 8 o'clock hearings were legendary in this courthouse uh, until Bill Alsup joined. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Judge Alsup beat him by about an hour and a half on that. However, uh, he did one thing that I don't think even Judge Alsup did, and that is he used to hold hearings on Saturday mornings. And I think Michael Rubin will remember this in the big antitrust car rental case, the MDL that he had. And his courtroom was literally filled with about 100 lawyers. We had court. Saturday morning, no air, no nothing to breathe, but uh, he felt that was the most efficient way to proceed, and, and he did. Um, 
I want to, uh, at this point, read a letter from uh, former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor that uh, she sent um, to the friends and family of, of Judge Renfrew. Uh, she says the following, I regret not being at this special occasion in person, but will be thinking of you all with much affection and respect. Everybody present knows of Charlie's stature as a world-class lawyer and nationally influential judge, but I wanted to reflect on his role as a dear friend. Some of my fondest memories are of wonderful fishing trips and delicious dinner parties with Barbara and Charlie. The conversations were always stimulating and Charlie's renowned puns never failed to generate much laughter. He was as remarkable on a personal level as on a judicial level, and I was fortunate to have been the recipient of his generosity of spirit, his loyalty, and his friendship. Although I will miss him, I will always treasure that. Barbara, I, spend, I send special thoughts to you, and you know that the wonderful memories of your year together will remain with you forever. Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, Chief Justice, former Chief Justice uh, Ron George of the California Supreme Court uh, also wanted to send a message, and although he's not here, we have a video uh, that he's prepared, so I'm gonna try to hit the right button here. I feel honored to participate in the celebration of the life of Judge Charles Renfrew, a person widely admired, loved, and known as Charlie. Only a family birthday celebration in Southern California could keep me from being here in person. I cannot recall precisely when or under what circumstances our paths first crossed, but I do know that early in our respective careers, I followed in his footsteps though from quite far behind. Charlie graduated from Princeton University in 1952 with a Bachelor of Arts degree, cum laude, and I followed him nine years later with a Bachelor of Arts degree, sine laude. Charlie joined the United States District Court for the Northern District of California in February of 1972 quickly immersing himself in a wide range of complex civil and criminal litigation. A couple of months later, I too became a judge upon my appointment to the Municipal Court of Los Angeles, where I was quickly immersed in a wide range of traffic offenses. And we both carried the title of Deputy Attorney General during various stages of our respective careers. Charlie in the position of Deputy AG in the U.S. Department of Justice, the number two slot in that agency carrying the responsibility of overseeing roughly 100,000 employees nationwide, and myself having gone from law school directly to the position of Deputy AG in the California Department of Justice, the entry-level spot with no one to supervise but oneself. There was undoubtedly something about these parallel career paths that brought us together at some point, but whatever it was, it grew into a warm and always entertaining friendship between Charlie and me and his Barbara and my Barbara. Our social get-togethers often involved dinner parties hosted at the Renfrew's home or ours. Sometimes held in honor of some visiting national or international dignitary. It became a standing joke among the four of us how to solve the problem of who should host a particular dinner. And there were a couple of occasions on which the Renfrews brought their guests of honor to our home, and we subsequently did the same in bringing our notable guests to the Renfrews. We would combine our guest lists, perhaps lending a new context to Ernest Hemingway's concept of a movable feast. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Justice Anthony Kennedy were part of these exchanges. At one of these dinners, the honoree at the Renfrew residence was Harry Wolf, who had recently ascended to the position of Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales after serving as master of the roles. On that occasion, Charlie could not resist asking me, sotto voce, whether we might next have the pleasure of meeting the master of the Bentleys. 
Among Charlie's many interests was his commitment to fostering understanding and an exchange of views with judges and lawyers from other nations. Always the gracious host, Charlie took pride in offering his finest wines to these foreign visitors, although on one occasion his generosity went unappreciated. As Charlie began to pour a glass of Cabernet for the Chief Justice of the High Court of a Third World Country, his unappreciative guest boldly interrupted the dinner conversation with the pronouncement, really, you Americans do drink much too much. Without missing a beat or adding a word, Charlie, consummate diplomat that he was, simply handed his guest a glass of Coca-Cola. I had the chance to work directly with Charlie while I served as president of the Conference of Chief Justices when he graciously agreed to my request that he accept a five-year term on the board of directors of the National Center for State Courts. In that position, he shared with others the commitment that he had to justice and his sense of fairness, contributing the expertise he had acquired in his judicial service, in alternative dispute resolution, and in the private business sector, to the great benefit of many. Among all of his talents, the one that perhaps will continue to stand out most for me is Charlie's very special sense of humor. For that trait truly reflects a sense of balance and perspective qualities that all of us seem to be much in need of today. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Michael Rubin, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Judge Renfrew's chambers. Uh, he preceded me, and we overlapped uh, by a couple of weeks, and he was my uh, mentor uh, for about two weeks. Um, uh, Michael clerked for Judge Renfrew between 1979 and, or 70 and 79, followed by clerkships with uh, Judge Browning uh, of the Ninth Circuit, and then uh, Justice William Brennan. Uh, among his many awards and accomplishments, uh, Mr. Rubin has won six, six California Lawyer of the Year awards from the California Lawyer Magazine Daily Journal. Little did I know he would go on to such great things when I first met him with Michael. Thank you, Ed, um, Judge Patel, distinguished guests, and, and most of all, members of the Renfrew family. It was 40 years ago, this past June in 1978, when Andrea Peterson, uh, my wife now, and I started our clerkships with Judge Renfrew. When we began, the judge had only been on the bench for six and a half years, and he turned 50 years old in the middle of our clerkship on Halloween. He was certainly a commanding presence, uh, especially to a couple of 27-year-olds, but his force of nature, personality, and his um, distinctive sense of humor were really only a small part of what made that clerkship year so memorable. What really made a difference to me was the way he approached the craft of judging and the gentle and thoughtful way Judge Renfrew taught his clerks, not only about cases and legal issues, but about making decisions and about taking responsibility for those decisions. So I'd like to offer just a few memories of what it was like to spend a year working with a judge and his secretary and office manager, Sylvia Rosier. Uh, Mrs. R, as she was known, had come over with a judge from Pillsbury. In many ways, she set the tone for our chambers. Uh, he wore the robes, to be sure, but woe to the arrogant attorney or law clerk applicant who crossed Mrs. R or who appeared to take her for granted. Our chambers were on the 17th floor of this building between Judge Conti and Judge Spencer Williams with Judge Renfrew's friend, William Oreck, just down the hall. Uh, so Andrea and I clerked in 1978 to 79, while Judge Peckham was still the chief judge. As a result, there were no women judges yet 
uh, in the Northern District or except for Shirley Hufstedler on the Ninth Circuit, although that would soon change under President Carter. As Judge Chen explained, uh, unlike most judges, Judge Renfrew didn't ask his law clerks to help him prepare for his weekly civil law and motion calendar by writing bench memos. He handled almost all of his civil and criminal motions work himself. As a result, our job on Wednesday and Thursday mornings was fairly simple. We needed to get to the courtroom for the weekly calendars before he did. We had to start the proceedings with the traditional Oye Oye call, admonishing all who had business before the Honorable United States District Court for the Northern District of California to draw near because court was now in session. And I don't think anyone does that anymore. Um, and maybe others didn't do it at the time either, but we certainly did before every calendar began. And then to pay close attention and to learn as much as we could from the proceedings. The judge said that the reason he didn't assign bench memos to his clerks was because he was a speed reader, which he was, and could review briefs a lot more quickly and efficiently than we could. That was true, of course. Given his experience and decisiveness, uh, ridiculous was a commonly heard word in chambers, he could spot the key facts and arguments in just a fraction of the time that we could. And because judicial caseloads were so much lighter then, a fast reading, quick thinking judge really didn't need clerks for most motions. There were certainly times under pressures of a TRO or when something new or unusual came up when he'd ask us to talk through the issues in advance of a hearing and help him focus his thoughts, but mostly we just watched and listened and learned as he'd instruct counsel to give him their best argument when it wasn't clear from the briefing or when he'd focus on a critical issue that the opposing party had only addressed in a footnote, or when he'd call out an attorney who inadvertently referred to quickly scanning a document when he really meant skimming it. The main reason, though, that Judge Renfrew excused his clerks from traditional bench memo work was probably because he often saw his judicial responsibilities as extending beyond the rights of the parties to a particular case. When a motion raised issues that he thought warranted deeper analysis or had broader implications, he would pull the briefing from that stack of weekly motions and set it aside for one of us to dig into. We would then function almost like appellate clerks, spending sometimes weeks on a single motion with the expectation in those pre-Westlaw, pre-Daily Journal days that the judge would later submit his written opinion to West Publishing Company for publication in the Federal Supplement. We'd usually begin by talking through the issues and arguments with the judge explaining his concerns and pointing out some of the complexities of the issues and why he was uncertain, which is always a welcome acknowledgement from a judge. Then would listen to the back and forth between the judge and counsel and court and maybe have follow-up discussions. But the process really became interesting after we prepared a draft opinion for his review. For unlike many clerkships where the judges submit a draft, get written comments and edits back from the judge, and then go back and forth in writing, Judge Renfrew turned every opinion writing assignment into a one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face interaction. Once we typed up a draft, cutting and pasting as necessary with scissors and scotch tape, we'd make a copy for ourselves and one for the judge, and then we'd pull from the shelves every case and authority that we cited, which would put in order on one or more wheeled library carts, which would then bring into chambers. There, Judge Renfrew would sit, often in short sleeves with his brightly colored suspenders, Although once uh, early on, I remember uh, he was wearing a seersucker suit, which he said he had put on because he was preparing a summary judgment. <laughs> he had started at the beginning of the draft, going word by word, phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, editing and commenting and asking questions as he went. And every time he came to a new citation, the judge would reach into the library cart, pull the case and read it. Then back to the draft and word for word again. You can imagine what a learning experience that was, and at least for the first few months, how terribly frightening. 
There were many ways that we as clerks learned from Judge Renfrew. He assigned us to work with attorneys on the first draft of all civil and criminal jury instructions, trying to reach consensus where possible, exploring compromise language, identifying any issues that required an on-the-record judicial ruling. He also taught by example. It was clear that the judge's family was his highest priority. He was a firm believer in sending handwritten thank you notes, um, like the letter Tony West just described in Sherilyn Eiffel's letter after her commencement speech at NYU. And he made sure to make time, despite his busy day job, for many other activities that kept him connected with friends and the world outside the courthouse. Not just the prestigious activities and the board memberships, but projects like a historical book club for which each member had to prepare an hour-long lecture on a forgotten historical figure. I remember him working for weeks, not using his clerks at all. This was just him before presenting on Richard Burton, the 19th century British adventurer, spy, diplomat, and the original translator of 1001 Nights. The last time Andrea and I visited Judge Renfrew and Barbara, just a little more than a week before he died, they were both sitting upstairs in their beautiful house on Clay Street. Barbara was reading Walter Isaacson's book on Leonardo da Vinci. The judge was engrossed in Ron Chernow's biography of Ulysses S. Grant. Our conversation included historical insights and thoughts on both books, as well as a discussion of family, friends, and our current political situation. And I thought about how much Judge Renfrew loved to share what he learned. I thought about how he loved telling stories, how I finally learned to wait for the slight pause or the twinkle in his eye, which were his tells, the signal that it was time to pay special attention because an outrageous pun or a tug of the leg was about to occur, especially if the story involved someone pompous or self-important. But mostly I thought about how lucky Andrea and I have been to have met Judge Renfrew when we did and to have been a small part of his and Barbara's life for these past 40 years, we will always miss his kindness and his counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Former director, FBI, uh, William Webster, uh, also sent a letter to the family, and I want to read uh, some excerpts from that. Um, and reads as follows. Charlie's life and mine had many parallels and common interests. We both served and benefited greatly from military experiences in World War II and the Korean War. We both became lawyers and later judges. And it wasn't until President Carter appointed us to the Department of Justice, I to head the FBI, and Charlie as Deputy Attorney General that we had an opportunity to collaborate professionally. It was during that time that our personal friendship took hold. Peter Benzinger, then DEA administrator, who wanted to talk to Charlie about staying on, reported on his initial conversation with Charlie. I asked, how did it go? Peter replied he wasn't sure. He continued, I suggested we meet in his office at 11.30 tomorrow. But Judge Renfrew responded that he preferred the meeting take place at quarter of 12. <laughs> Typical Renfrew humor. Threw him for a loop. Now, after Charlie's work with the Justice Department, Department, we shared an interest in organizations such as the American Law Institute, CPR, ABA, and the American College of Trial Lawyers. While the legal gatherings gave us numerous opportunities to collaborate intellectually, the very best times I had with Charlie were shared with our wonderful wives and our involvement uh, in our involved uh, collective pursuit of trout. Charlie and Barbara traveled the world of fish, and for over 20 years, we shared houses on the Missouri River in Montana. We would meet every evening to grill, sometimes incinerate, our dinner, uh, lie about our catches, and consume far too much lovely wine that Charlie and Barbara always brought. What I love most about Charlie was his innate fairness, his loyalty, his decency, his unquestionable integrity, and that special Renfrew sense of humor. I doubt that heaven needs lawyers, and there is already a well-known presiding judge. So I'm confident that Charlie instead is enjoying rich conversations with good people from all walks of life. No doubt, he's still telling stories and commanding the room with his special humor and indefatigable spirit, William Webster. 
Uh, next, we're going to hear from Guy Saperstein, who is a founding partner of Saperstein, Goldstein, Demchek, and Baller. Uh, he successfully prosecuted one of the largest sex, race, and age discrimination cases in the nation, and he's a past president of the Sierra Club Foundation. Guy? I've met uh, many fine lawyers and judges in my life. Some are in this room. But I never met anyone as committed to the idea of justice as Charlie Renfrew. I had the good fortune of drawing Charlie in the first trial I ever did in the Northern District, which started at 8 a.m., of course. My first Title VII class action my biggest case ever, and finally, the last case of my career, which I co-counseled with Charlie. The case was a very complicated and politically hot False Claims Act case against Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, but the real party interest was the National Security Agency, Lockheed's client for developing satellite surveillance systems and other listening devices. The day I filed my case, my office was broken into, my computer database was destroyed. This was no small matter as my bread and butter caseload was, computer, was contained in computerized personnel records. I called my computer scientists in from Cal. They said whoever did this was way more sophisticated than me. When a fi then a fire was mysteriously started in the bedroom of my plaintiff where she had kept documents for the case. Then I discovered my office had been bugged. This was my introduction to the deep state. I called the FBI and explained what had happened. And the FBI agent was dutifully taking notes and in his notebook, and then I mentioned that the NSA was involved, at which point he slowly closed his notebook, put down his pencil, and he said, if the NSA is involved, there's nothing we can do. The FBI can't help you. We're like Boy Scouts compared to the NSA, and we can't touch them. So much for my civil liberties. Ratchet forward to eight years of, of threats by the DOJ to close down my case with a state secrets privilege and two appeals to the Ninth Circuit. And I was finally getting the discovery that I needed to prove my case. But just as I was beginning to see daylight, the DOJ filed a state secrets privilege claim supported by affidavits from the Secretary of Army and the Director of the CIA, John Deutsch. I could see from the contents of the affidavits that they were fraudulent as they made hyperbolic claims about my case. So I, and I had a back channel to the CIA who confirmed that. So I promptly noticed Deutsch's deposition and when, he failed, when the DOJ failed to produce him, filed a motion to compel. My suspicion, and in my moving papers, I placed my p suspicions, which if proven would have led to the disbarment of several DOJ lawyers and maybe jail. I had been doing pretty well with the judge in this case, but as soon as the state secrets privileged claim was filed, everything changed, and I realized it was a completely different ball game. All of a sudden, the judge wasn't listening to me. And so on the way back from a hearing, which had not gone well for me, I had nothing to do, I, but I knew I had to do something, and had to do it fast. So I've, 
in, almost instinctually drove over to Charlie's office, in John Kecker's office. And I was unannounced, but he saw me almost immediately, and I explained to him what had happened, and I needed to take the director of the CIA's deposition. At this point in his career, of course, Charlie had a hugely important and remunerative arbitration practice. The last thing in the world he needed was my messy case with the NSA, CIA, and DOJ. But Charlie looked at me and said, the only way we can get to the truth of this matter and serve justice is by taking that deposition. Yes, I will join you and do it. At the motion to compel hearing, Charlie began his argument by reciting the very complicated procedural history of the case. Afterwards, I said to him, I have been prosecuting this case for eight years, and I never could have done that without copious notes. Charlie chuckled and said, yes, I used to do that all, all the time before the Senate Judiciary Committee. It always impressed them. Charlie then gave an argument about how justice demanded that we take John Dorsch's deposition. It was the most erudite and passionate argument I've ever heard on a law motion calendar. But the motion was denied. About three years ago, I invited Charlie out to lunch, met him at his office, and we went out, went out to lunch and talked for more than two hours about cases we had had together. When I got to the Lockheed case, I said, Charlie, I think you are probably the only well-established lawyer in the country who ever would have considered taking on the NSA, the CIA, and the DOJ in that gnarly case I brought to you. Charlie looked at me and slowly said, yes, you are probably right about that. That was Charlie, absolutely one of a kind and totally committed to justice. We have a letter from somebody whose name may be familiar to you all, uh, Robert Mueller. Anybody heard of uh, Bob Mueller? Uh, now, is this going to be a special announcement? That the, no. We're, we're just going to have former Chief Judge Patel uh, read. That's okay. And she's, she's got, I think, it's a little commentary to go, as she normally does, to go along with this uh, presentation. So, Chief? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I received this letter in my home. Uh, the only thing it said on the envelope was the Office of the Special Counsel. Fortunately, there was no indictment and no subpoena in it. <laughs> but I offered to read uh, the letter because um, Barbara told me a story, which I just thought was delightful and, uh, and, very sh and it was very short. But um, we all know that Charlie had an extraordinary, legendary sense of humor. Um, Bob Mueller? Maybe not so much. <laughs> but she tells this story how she and Charlie were in church, and Charlie, in that same voice that uh, Justice um, uh, just referred to a few moments ago, um, that sotto voce or that stage aside voice, apparently turned to Barbara and said, don't look now, but somebody who looks just like Bob Mueller is sitting behind you. Well, apparently Bob did, Barbara did take a quick look and turned back, and as she was looking, that gentleman who was Bob Mueller leaned over and said, don't look now, but seated to your left is a man who looks just like Charlie Renfrew. <laughs> <laughs> so 
there is a sense of humor. And uh, as you can imagine, I'm sure he would love to be here, but I've heard he's busy. And so he sends this letter. Dear family and friends of Judge Charles, R. R. Charles B. Renfrew, today we celebrate the life and career of Judge Renfrew. I first met Judge Renfrew in 1972 at Pillsbury, Madison, and Sutro when I was a summer associate. The judge interviewed me and was instrumental in my decision to accept an offer with the firm. He was a first class lawyer and counselor and a person I wanted to emulate. By the time I joined the US Attorney's Office in United States Attorney's Office in San Francisco, Judge Renfrew had been appointed as a federal judge in the Northern District of California. In civil cases, Judge Renfrew had a unique ability to cut through the procedural complexities, identify crucial issues in the case, and drive the parties to an early resolution. In criminal cases, he was adept at focusing on critical issues and ensuring justice was served for both the defendant and the government. Notably, in every case, he developed a deep understanding of both the evidence and the person standing before him as a defendant. When it came to sentencing, Judge Renfrew invested the time necessary to understand the defendant's circumstances and motivations. He considered the person and the likelihood of rehabilitation. In short, Judge Renfrew was the perfect jurist and we in the profession were indeed blessed to have had him, had cases with him. To Barbara and the family, we thank you for sharing the judge with us. God bless Robert S. Muller III. Thank you. Our last speaker is John Kecker, whose name you heard, uh, founder obviously of Kecker Van Est and Peters in 1978. Uh, besides his many awards and accomplishments, uh, Mr. Kecker served as the Iran served the Iran Contra Independent Council as lead prosecutor of Oliver North, and has been active in numerous uh, San Francisco City commissions. Uh, I will say that I first became acquainted with John when I was clerking for Judge Renfrew. And Judge Renfrew, one of the practical things he would teach us is to say, "Look at, watch this lawyer who, as they come in, uh, pay special attention to this person. He's an excellent litigator." And I will say. Uh, John was one of those so identified. Uh, so much so that, in fact, uh, while I was clerking, I had a family legal matter, and I actually called John Kecker up to, to represent my family, probably unethical at that time, and I didn't know better. Uh, but, you know, he said, well, we'd love to, but we only, there's only two of us, and we're waiting for this new clerk to finish with Judge Oreck, this guy named Bob Van Est. And once he becomes, uh, joins our firm, we'll have three. Maybe we can represent you at that point. So I knew John, but he's very, very young. So John. John. Thank you, Judge Chen. I don't remember, I can't imagine why we would turn down a case because we didn't have any business at the time. Uh, so that's probably apocryphal. I bet you remember it wrong. Um, and we really didn't. Uh, but I'm honored to have this chance to remember Charlie, who uh, became not just a person I admired and a great judge to me, but a good friend. Uh, and I'm very happy that so many of his friends, so many judges uh, are here. Uh, Barbara, it's a tribute to the life you and Charlie had together, the, uh, the, the many people that you gathered who loved you both. I was thinking about Judge Renfrew uh, during the funeral ceremony for John McCain. They were both very special uh, in a way that is unfortunately rare today. They were both men of honor. Uh, men of honor serve their country. There's various ways to do it, but Charlie did it in the military. You already heard he was in the Navy at 17 years old at the end of World War II, went to Princeton on the GI Bill where he was in, the, in Army ROTC, and then he went to Korea as a second lieutenant uh, where he was a forward observer. It's the most dangerous job in combat because you have to stick your head up 
to see where the shells are landing and you have to move the shells around. Uh, to make it even more dangerous, he was assigned to the French sector of the demilitarized zone. Um, he didn't have to do that dangerous job. Uh, the people who go to Princeton can get a job in the rear with, you know, rear with the gear if they want to, but that's not what men of honor do. And Charlie served right out front in combat. Men of honor aren't uh, greedy or overly acquisitive. Charlie, after law school, as you've heard, came out, worked at the largest law firm west of the Mississippi. People forget that. Uh, uh, Pillsbury, Madison, and Sutro. Uh, he did well there. As you've heard, he became a partner. He was very active in, in civil, uh, civic activities, particularly civil rights. But his heart was set on being a judge. And he didn't want to be a judge for the prestige. He certainly didn't want to be a judge for the salary. Uh, he did it because he found it to be a higher calling, and that's the way he saw it. He loved the law. He loved uh, the, the idea that all people are equal before the law. He loved the idea that legal decisions had room for uh, mercy and compassion as well as righteousness. Uh, and he also loved to work hard. I've never seen a judge work so hard. There was one time that Judge Conti was um, leaving. His, his chambers were next door. He said, Charlie, what are you doing here so late? And, and Judge Renfrew said, I'm working, uh, I'm writing findings of fact and conclusions of law. Judge Conti was horrified. He said, get the lawyers to do that. And Judge Renfrew said, no, these are my findings of fact and my conclusions of law, and I'm going to write them. Um, he took sentencing of criminal defendants incredibly seriously. He worked hard to understand the human consequences of conviction and incarceration. Uh, and he never took himself too seriously, except when he took that bench. Uh, then there wasn't any fooling around. I remember one very difficult criminal case I was defending. Judge Renfrew was, the, was presiding. Bob Muller was the prosecutor. Uh, and I had very little to work with. And so at some point, I uh, began to talk about my client sort of being in the same situation as Nathan Sharansky, who was a famous Russian dissident who was being persecuted in the Russian courts at that moment. And that didn't go over very well with either uh, the judge or Bob Mueller, although I'm very proud to say and happy to remember, even though I lost the case, Bob was so mad and so riled up that he, all he could do is sputter during his rebuttal. Um, so at least I got that much. Um, as a man of honor, Charlie was never uh, impressed overly impressed by the high and mighty. He was never obsequious. Uh, when he wasn't on the bench, you all know he was always joking, he was making horrible puns, and if necessary, he was puncturing pomposity where he found it. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that he was pompous, but when he first met the Lord Chief Justice, uh, Harry Wolf, he quickly, he was introduced to uh, Chief Justice Wolf, and so this is a man who, who had been Queen's Counsel, he'd been Member of Parliament, he'd been the head of the Financial Services Administration, he'd been Master of the Rolls, and Charlie's reaction when he met him was to say, so, you really have trouble keeping a job, do you? <laughs> um, and then there's the, the story that Judge Webster said about the, uh, told you about the, and that Judge Chen told, read from Judge Webster about the DEA, uh, the, the DEA introduction where he said, I want to be there at, uh, at 345, and Charlie said, no, 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 that's inconvenient, come at quarter till four. Now, that's a story most of you have probably heard many times, but that's another thing I wanted to say I learned from Charlie Renfrew. If you have a good story to tell, tell it over and over. <laughs> um, and and I've, I've used that. Uh, finally, men of honor care about other people. More, as much as they do about themselves. Charlie's commitment to civil rights, you've heard about his service on the boards of civil rights organizations, not just LDF, is, are well known. 
You members of his family know uh, that he was honest and loyal. He was concerned about every one of you and the welfare of every one of you. The law clerks uh, know that he, rem he stayed interested in your careers and your babies and your, you know, just everything about you. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to him because you've heard a little bit about this from Judge Chen, but when, when this little two-person firm of, of Kecker and Brockett started, uh, we benefited greatly from Charlie saying to people that we were good trial lawyers and that you ought to consider doing them, and we, we benefited maybe most importantly from him persuading uh, Bob Van Nest, who was a clerk for Judge Oreck, that it would be okay to come. Judge Oreck was horrified. What, you, what, you, a talented person, want to go work for this little two-person firm? And, and uh, Charlie convinced him that it was probably a good idea and it was going to work out, and as far as I'm concerned, it's really worked out. Um, <laughs> So, I'm so glad that Charlie came back to, to judging at the end of his career, which he did for almost 20 years as an arbitrator. Uh, he was much in demand, as you know. I'm very proud that he did it out of an office in our office uh, while he was doing that. He continued in our office with all these young lawyers getting to know him to inspire uh, several generations of lawyers uh, by helping them un understand that pr probably the only meaningful career aspiration that you can have as a lawyer is to be a man or woman of honor. And I find it amazing that I find it hard to say that in this day and time, but I, I can imagine what Charlie would think, would say about this day and time. So thank you very much for listening and thank you for being here. Thank you, John. Thank you, Judge Chen. Thank you to all of our speakers, letter writers, video recorded uh, folks who have joined us today. Thank you especially to Judge Patel, former Chief Judge Patel, who put this panel together and did it wonderfully, as you can tell. We have outside a small reception for all of us who are here, so please, if you have a moment, take a moment have a glass, have a bite, chat with some of your friends, reminisce about Judge Renfrew, and thank you all for coming. Right. Yes, the, the, the letter that Tony West read is in its complete form outside on the table and can be picked up and taken home. Thank you. <laughs>